French Golden Age <coughs> Automaton, and that's produced between 1850 and 1910, sort of up to the First World War in Paris, where there were competing families, <coughs> all family firms, five major ones, who were producing the best automata still around today, with the exception of what you see here in the, the modern <laughs> craft movement. So you had firms like Roulet and Decomp, Vichy, uh, Bon Tons with their birds, and it was a bit like um, Apple Macs versus Microsoft Windows and stuff like that. So it was high tech. People were seriously impressed by this recorded music and also things coming to life. So it's high technology exported all over the world, just like computers are now. So it's a bit difficult to get a handle on it. Talking of getting a handle on it, here we have a wonderful thing with a great big handle on the back. And uh, this is uh, basically it's a barrel organ, a parlour organ, designed with nice quality woods and uh, I think it's a burr, nice burr uh, veneer on the back in particular. And the organ itself here is almost a completely separate thing to the automaton scene here. This was made by a different maker, almost certainly to the organ, but they worked in conjunction. Just like the French automata makers never made their music, those came from over the border in Switzerland. So they, they um, worked together to bring these pieces to life to entertain. The organ itself, I'll just speak a bit about that, traditional um, cylinder organ, a big wooden cylinder, um, a bit like a section of telegraph poles, except segmented and glued so that it doesn't warp and split. And all this cylinder is covered in metal staples. So there'll be some long staples and some short ones, and you get the drift, the long notes, short staccato notes. And um, so it's covered in those, and that rotates and operates the air valves for uh, ranks of pipes in here. So there'll be pipes, some wooden and some metal pipes. And so the air valves are tripped by the staples in the barrel, off it goes, and there's a big wooden gear on the end, which is turned by a worm on the handle. So handle, worm, ring gear, round goes the cylinder, and we've forgotten one thing here, the air supply. So below the, um, the big cylinder is a great big bellows, and that's got um, two pumping chambers, and then a reservoir, so they pump and the reservoir inflates. I don't know if some <coughs> of these are using that system here, but it's by far the most successful system is to inflate a reservoir with a spring on it, so you get constant pressure. And that's where all the air is taken for that rank of pipes. Now it's much cleverer than I'm making it out to be, because this will play up to 12 different tunes. Each revolution of that barrel gives you one tune. So in order to get 12 tunes, you move the whole cylinder longitudinally by say a fraction of a millimetre, no, in this it will be maybe up to two millimetres. Yeah, we've got about that far sideways movement in all. So 12 tunes will fill the space. So you bring another track of pins into play and there's a knife edge to set the cylinder so it definitely plays that. So that's all the geeky stuff on how, how this works. You need plenty of power and a big arc of swing. And then on the top, We've got some of those pins on the bell will be designated to operate the automaton scene. And now you've got a monkey scene in a bedroom, uh, a group of monkeys in a bedroom as you'd have. <laughs> <laughs> the French loved their finely dressed aristocratic monkeys. And we don't 100% know why, but the story has it that at the big balls in the palaces, all the musicians and all the waiters would have monkey masks because they were just as finely dressed as guests but you could tell them apart because they had monkey masks on. And so for all the entertainers, there you have the monkey-faced automaton. It's there to entertain you. 
and provide you with a pleasure. They, they had monkey wallpapers, monkey rooms, monkey books. It was something of a craze. So the monkey scene here, and it's used a lot in automata work, these monkeys. They move their top and bottom lips with really fine leather coverings. They have this kind of, um, I think it's a prehensile top lip. Always goes in automata and we have to restore the top lips on them. It's a comical scene where I think he's jabbing something in the bed and the monkey in the bed will be smiling or grimacing and jumping up and down here. And in good original condition, with fine silk clothes and really fine wigs as well. And the earlier, this is how you get the age, this is about 1860 to 1880, within that couple of decades. The earlier you get, the finer the wig quality. So when you get to 1880, 1890, it starts to get a little bit um, less refined with the little ringlets and things. Real hair, of course. Uh, was, it, was it Surf who did the Monkey Orchestra? Is it, isn't it? Surf pottery? <coughs> the pottery pieces. So you see it a lot in yeah. French uh, yes, it was. decoration. So you, was you it? get a lot of crossover with automata <coughs> and the pottery pieces yeah. and the sculpted busts and things like this. The most famous one is the uh, banjo playing bust, um, which is done a lot in uh, bronze pottery and Gustav Vichy did it in an automata form. Mm. So it goes, whatever was popular around mm. there in culture was <coughs> also automated. Yeah. So any more questions on this kind of piece or, or on the antique automata? It's really beautiful. So, well, I know it. Well, I'm in the zone. <laughs> <laughs> it should have a fantastic sound. I mean, it's a shame this one suffers from the bellows leather needs redoing and probably a few other bits once you open it up. It's usually a big story. So what is your restoration process? When you, when you first open it up, do you do a, an assessment? And then how do you proceed to document and take it apart? Yeah, that's the first thing. You get your big book open on a fresh page and <laughs> write the name of your client and, yeah. and sharpen your pencil. And then we put the top aside, we give it a swing, see what's happening, nothing. Put the top aside with all the mechanism for the automata because that'll stay attached to the underneath mm -hmm. and it should just lift off. And then there's a door on the side we can take out the barrel. It was made to be handled, it was made to be repaired which is another great thing. The, the knife edge that's on this thing will lift off the keyframe away from the staples. Mm -hmm. And using very little uh, metal parts, it's all wooden wedges and blocks and chocks, you can take the whole thing apart in a matter of minutes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the more protracted process of covering the bellows and also getting the valves right. I think you've got seven valves within these bellows and they're all hidden inside, mm -hmm. so they have to be right before, and you can't test them until it's all done. Yeah, and so, do pins wear out, or do, does dry rot occur? That Yeah, woodworm likes this mm -hmm. sort of thing, and you often have to um, have a new barrel made, or you have to... Wonderful, not me. <laughs> not me. <laughs> And the big ring gears wear a lot. You get, well, I know what will be inside this. You'll see a lot of really lovely green gungy grease that's gone off and smells wonderfully because it's all sort of animal fats and things. And that'll be all over that big wooden ring gear. And it'll be worn like that, like an old step on a sort of Georgian front porch. And, and then there's a point where it no, the worm no longer turns it and you can't really justify just jamming it down further into engagement. You have to make a new gear. So there's all them kind of things to decide. And you mill the new gear yourself? Um, I wouldn't on this. This is too big and it's wood. So mm -hmm. I'm a metal worker. So for something like that, I'd send that out to be done. Or I might even go... Oh, we have done these. Um, but I'd prefer to send it to an organ maker. I don't have a musical ear at all. Mm. So when it comes to any tuning of the length of the pipes and the stops, 
well, I think I can do it, so it looks lovely, it looks perfect. <laughs> and I'll play it to my wife and she just laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> so I give up with uh, yeah. music. And, yeah. and the extremes of the movement, do you, do you alter those? Are you able to fine-tune the interior yeah. scene? This, this particularly would present quite a few challenges because you've got original clothes in a state of completely fragile, about to go. Mm. So ideally you want to undress each automaton in there, take off the coats, the shirts and everything. You'll have to restring them because the strings will just pull apart in your mm -hmm. hands. And it goes right up into these tiny heads. These are papier-mâché heads and there's cross axles in there, cross wires, which are really fine and very highly stressed because they take that big the springs, right. brass springs, which um, corrode with age and mm -hmm. um, they just snap. So there's a lot of work that usually has to go on in the heads. But what we would do on this one is we make every effort to not remove the clothes. So we try and get the heads off as there is, and then we do a lot of work with long forceps going up, mm -hmm. trying to restring without taking the clothes off. And sometimes we'll, try, we'll get into a bit of textile restoration and back the, the silks and things to try and hold them together for another. And do you use adhesives for those kinds of things, or? Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> How long would it take to restore? Um, on something like this, oh, it, would take? it would take me probably about um, four to six weeks of actual work, but I probably want it for a year mm -hmm. to, to do those four to six right. weeks. With textile restoration now and something like this, it's only just becoming worthwhile to do the job properly, because you've got to sew your backing material on, really, mm -hmm. and um, that takes a hell of a lot longer. And only now am I meeting people prepared to pay for the amount of time it takes for me to get my wife to sign. <laughs> you know, usually we're just saving it um, yeah. by backing. And applying it to a backing. Yeah, yeah. Really and sometimes if they have the Elizabethan collars, you can remove the collar and still get access enough to the head yeah. to be able to do what you need to yeah, do. Yeah, you can usually get into the, into the head there. And, and um, the heads are usually sort of pinned on on like little tanks holding mm -hmm. to a wooden neck core. Which for some reason we won't love. So we've replaced a lot of neck cores, um, which is fun. What type of wood do you use? Um, I've got a big box of nice old pieces of wood, and we just look for something of the same grain and some sort of density. Same vintage too? Yeah, usually the same vintage. Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, as I said before, my workshop is completely cluttered. So I can usually <laughs> find you know, not something. We can sometimes find silks. Yeah. What I'm saying. So where are you based? Are you based in London? Or? No, I work out from uh, near Inverness. It's uh, Fintorn along the coast, where the dolphins are. Yeah. We're just in the forest, so the big old yeah. steady. Yeah, and if uh, you're over up that way, email, show you, show you the workshop and the studio there. Yeah. We do little yeah. events sometimes, like the candles and Get the, get the quiet old automatic creak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what sort of woods do you prefer to work or repair or replace it with? I mean, yeah, no, I prefer not to work in wood at yeah. all. Because as a clockmaker, I'm like my brasses and my steels. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of woodwork involved, and automata restoration is about multi skilledness. Yeah. So my wife does paint, sculpting, and all the cosmetics. She, she'll do the clothes, we sort of half and half on clothes. And I'm a clockmaker, mechanics, and historical. And uh, so we divide it. And that covers, between the two of us, we cover kind of more than any other one single restorer does, I think. Yeah. Would you, for instance, use um, nylon for, for movements and things, or the modern... No, no, not at all. Do you, for some reason, I don't tend to work. We've, um, we've experimented with modern materials, but always it's the old linen threads or whipping cords, yeah. and none of this braided nylon cord, where it just, just yeah. slips so yeah. things. And, and yeah. No, I mean, for instance, making corks and... Um, 
the kind of box is very... No, no, no bo boxwood or is it um, rhododendron, really yeah. dense yeah. things like that for the cogs. And I'll just put it on a knife with lathe and turn it as if it's a mm -hmm. metal. And uh, well, that works out all right. And then um, cogs like, say in the big diorama we're working on at the moment, which has got deer running in the forest and several bridges with a fast train, slow train, windmill, water wheel, all that kind of coming. Heaps of cogs. And most of them have a brass tube insert to mm -hmm. stop the um, centre hole wearing. Yeah. Yeah, it's good like that. Yeah, it's, uh, like the French had a lightness of touch and a simple kind of pragmatic engineering sort of philosophy that works really well. Whereas the English, it's all heavy tractor like over engineering mm -hmm. and super fine finishes on heavy blocks of steel. Well, the French came out of the window and they used a lot of wood as well. Um, so, much that I don't like it, we do. Use it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I'm around to answer any more questions or anything. And um, Could you yeah. speak very briefly about your involvement with the Hugo movie? Oh, yeah, I spoke a bit earlier on that. Uh -huh. Um, I got a call to go down there and I helped to design the ingredients of the automaton, the actual Hugo automaton. And initially, Brian Selznick, the author, had filled the automaton, that's the back of it, with the only kind of mechanism he could get as he went out around New York, and that was American clock movements. So when I first saw the art department's drawings, they were just full of Ansonia clock movements and escapements and all this stuff from clocks. And Scorsese wanted it to be an automaton through and through. So um, all I did was pull in the mechanisms from the Jacques Hedro writer and draftsman and the Melody automaton mm -hmm. in the Franklin Institute, which is the one that inspired Selznick originally. And so we've got a selector disc from the writer. We've got the drum here from the uh, piano player, mm -hmm. or clavicle player. And um, we've got, um, there's a big central can stack that goes up and down. So this, everything's there for it to do what it should do, plus more. And we just try to erase the clock part. But then Scorsese would come and see Say, so I've seen these jewels in watches, you know, they're great red rubies, I want my tum to have jewels. Well, it's a little bit, wouldn't really have been jewelled, but we stuck some big red jewels <laughs> in, in the right place, because you can't say no. <laughs> yeah. And teaching the actors how to do stuff like how to clean it, little yeah. strips of cloth. You know, how to hold the screwdrivers with the finger steadying the end and the turning the finger and thumb. Mm -hmm. So they look like uh, basic stuff. How to sit at the bench on a low chair so that it's all here. Right. Instead of sitting doing it like that, because that's wrong. That's Watch right. Maker. So there was a lot of kind of training, work a day stuff like that, mm -hmm. which was good and it all got right. And how many different uh, uh, figurines were there? Uh, in, in total? Yeah, they made, um, just have a little guess in your own mind, <laughs> it was a very complex thing, they made 15 of these. Um, they're all fiberglass creations, they, they have an electric secret, there's a CAD CAM machine in the thickness of the table which is computer controlled and the plotter head under the table, got a picture of the table somewhere, that um, has a magnet on it that drags the hand around, which also has a magnet. Mm -hmm. So despite all this accuracy and everything, they insisted on cheating, and uh, for good reason, because that's how films are made, yep. in little sections repeated. So, yeah, yeah it worked out well. And here's one of the drawings that the automaton did. Mm. George oh, Melies, yes. yeah. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. famous picture there. This one is the actual, is an, an actual one by the automaton. And um, yeah, did a good job. And then they put that automaton down sometimes on metal grills and they pumped steam up by the gallon. And the computer still worked, and the electric still worked, it still did it. So. <laughs> <laughs> much better than so the that is the one your automaton made? 
That's actually made by an automaton. You are the drawing, that drawing you yeah, to yeah, that's one. You said it, your automaton worked as it should do, yeah. but still that's very impressive. Yeah, that's it is. Really but exciting. what's peculiar is it took 45 minutes to do that. When you run the sequence straight, the computer oh, program course. straight through, it takes 45 minutes and all that. Yeah, but Jacques, that. Jacques Dre writer does it in, you know, it's like uh, 90 seconds to <laughs> two and a quarter minutes to draw maybe a galleon <laughs> or something or write a poem. You know, much quicker and more flowy. And still with the pen dips. <laughs> Anyone who didn't see my fairy ship, I'm very proud of it. Just got it back from having its work done. So rocks to and fro, side to side, and plays God Save the King, 1810. Same barrel principle here, but in brass this time. And unfortunately, a temporary spring breakage prevents it doing that. It's good because it's probably better in the imagination. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Matt, and uh, uh, yeah, do ask me any questions if I'm...